John and have been to some of his talks, and you'll know that he's an excellent speaker. He's a wildlife artist, ecologist, author of several publications, including the Wildlife of Dartmoor. He's a consultant naturalist on many BBC um, TV and radio programmes, including One Show and Life on the Underground. Um, I've been to John's garden, and it's a shining example. The wildlife cannot just exist um, in a small urban garden, but positively thrive alongside people, given the right habitat. Um, so, I'll hand okay. over to John. Thank you very much. Barnaby 
there at the front, and Oscar at the back, Oscar's best, but he's an outdoor education guy, so he's good at uh, steering the canoe, would be rubbish. Um, Barnaby lives in, he did live in Iceland for a couple of years now, he lives in Germany, and he's a computer programmer, and he also makes hurdy gurdies. Especially <laughs> hurdy Oscar's an outdoor education, he's just finished uh, a course at Exeter, Haven Banks and Exeter doing mountain biking and all sorts of things like that. And mountain biking is his thing. He's currently working at Riverford Farm, shifting veg boxes for people, and uh, he hopes to get out to Canada to do some mountain biking course next year. Joyce, my wife, uh, is uh, a teacher, so she uh, teaches at psychology and criminology at uh, Coon Tech College in Newton Abbott. And uh, out of all the family now, the boys obviously have lost their interest, or Barnaby's moved away, and Oscar's not really that interested in gardening, so it's Joyce and I who sit down the garden. Uh, when Joyce isn't teaching, she's uh, keen on taiko drumming, so, uh, this is Japanese drumming, and they, the UK centre for taiko drumming is at Seal Hay, uh, just near Newton Allen. If anyone wants to have a go, there's opportunities to have a go at uh, drumming, just have a chat with Joyce afterwards. So, our garden is a bit of a wildlife garden. As, a, as an ecologist uh, and wildlife artist, I, it's a, a workplace as well for me. Um, so I'm often at, sat out in the garden drawing and painting. So I'm actually, I draw and paint wildlife from, from life. So I take a lot of photographs as well, but I don't actually draw from photographs. I always draw from the real thing. Um, and this is our allotment. Um, it's a little bit overgrown. Um, it could be a bit wild, some people think. That's been a bit abandoned, but it's uh, there's lots of vegetables, and I've got a few tips for um, growing vegetables as well, which I'll give you later on. So this is our garden. So if it was a lawn, as I said, to start with, uh, but none of us were keen on cutting the grass, so we dug it all up. And uh, for several years, it became a bit of an experimental zone, really, for me, mainly, <laughs> to plant various things and import various bits of habitat. Um, from all sorts of bits of heathland and sand dunes, sort of mini habitats in there. So it was very much experimental. At times it looked quite beautiful, um, like this, um, but most of the time it looked a bit like this. It looked a bit wild and overgrown. So, um, and a bit like this as well. So a bit of a sort of scrubland, as my wife called it. Um, so uh, a few years ago now we decided to formalise it and actually make it a wildlife garden which was actually a nice looking garden as well but for the majority of the year. So what we did is completely redesigned the garden and we brought in a lot of materials. So and all of these were pretty well free. Uh, we imported some tyres to us put the idea of making a, a tyre garden. So it actually uh, makes it a bit more three dimensional rather than having a flat garden, actually having a bit of structure in the garden. Uh, by importing some tyres, and these are free because they, the tyre companies have to pay to get rid of them. So if you want some tyres, just go to whatever tyre company I went to, uh, Heathfield, and they, they gave me as many as I wanted to have. So we filled this up. Uh, we did buy in some soil, sort of filled that up with soil, and so that was a nice new area of the, of the garden. I collected up a lot of rocks and old bits of um, bits and bobs which I found from the tip in various places when I was out and about and uh, sort of made some paths and actually put some structure into the garden to build into it. Uh, I did collect quite a lot of gravel as well and sand. And I get this from there's a quarry down on the old King Stainton um, Road, uh, just between Newton Abbott and King Stainton. There's a quarry there which you can, it's much cheaper to buy sand and gravel from there if you want to get those sort of materials. And so we built up the garden over the winter, set it all up and then started to plant it out. And we really wanted to have lots of flowers because I'm uh, very keen on bees, as you'll see a few bees in the talk. And so we wanted to attract lots of bees and other pollinating insects. So this was it at the start of the season. And gradually we put more and more plants in and it started to bloom. And by the summer it was looking pretty good. Uh, lots of flowers and it was actually, you know, it wasn't quite mature yet really, but it was, um, it was starting to look like, like what we, we wanted. And Joyce was certainly a lot happier with it. And with all the flowers as well, it looked really quite beautiful during the summer months. And lots of pollen and nectar for the insects, which uh, now abound in our garden. It's buzzing with, with uh, insects during the summer months. <coughs> now, we've also got, apart from our garden, there's little edges which you can use as well. So this is the along the path. And it's actually only a tiny, really a tiny bit of habitat, which is just along the edge of the fence. 
but allow this to grow out, it's not too far out into the park, but uh, allow lots of plants to grow out there during the summer, which is another source of nectar, lots of butterflies and insects on those flowers, and uh, during the winter months I just cut that back, so in the autumn I just strip the whole lot back, and then it's all neat and tidy, and uh, then the following spring it will all come back to life, so you get all those flowers coming out again. There are some rules and regulations from the council on, the, on this sort of thing. We did uh, sort of get into trouble once, but they actually sent a letter to another house in our road, which didn't even have any rules to see them. They did tell us. And, and there are certain rules that you're not allowed to let um, trees and things actually grow right over the road, um, or things get too far out into the park. Um, but there, you can look this up on the, on the local council website for the exact rules if you, if you want to do this sort of thing or let things grow out that much. And we've also got this little area by an electricity substation beside our house, which they rarely visit. So there's again, there's a little patch there which I can manage. So I don't let it get too wild, but I you know, let a few things grow in between the cracks and that's another good spot. Oh, more little more sites for insects and also the things are growing through the concrete so it's a nice warm habitat for things which is what a lot of these insect, insects like. Uh, luckily our house faces south, most of our garden faces south so it's a, a really nice warm sun trap as well. So these are our ponds that we set up, they're quite simple ponds really, they're set up uh, just in the flower beds and they're a very easy way to make a pond in your garden. Um, and it's uh, very attractive to frogs. And all they are, and I, I, this was the other week, I had to clean it out because there's a lot of duckweed growing on it. And all the pond is, is something, I, I found these at the tip, I know that you can buy them. And uh, they're basically like a, a plastic flower pot with a big lip along the top of it. So it's a big, a flat area, and then a small, small pond, not, not very big. Um, and these you can just slot in, I've got a tire which I've, embedded into the ground. I can just slot this pond in. I could move it around if I wanted to. It's very quick and easy and, it, and you can, once it occasionally gets like this, gets filled with duckweed so I can just take it out, clean it out and then it's uh, put some new weed in and then it's back to, uh, back to how I want it so not too infested with weed. And it's brilliant for frogs and uh, which I'll show you in a minute. I've also got some other small pools in the garden, and these are just tiny little plastic pots, no sort of like big yogurt pots or you know pots like that. Any little patches of water that you can just put in the garden, just in amongst the flower bed. And the frogs love these, particularly when it's very dry in the summer. I've often sat up putting the washing out in the back garden here, and, and I hear some croaking. I think where's that coming from? And it's from this tiny little pot, and the frogs living in there, and it's croaking away. It's quite happy. So just tiny little patches of water like that are also very useful, apart from big ponds. Uh, birds, of course, love it. Uh, birds need some water, uh, somewhere to drink and also to bathe, so they like this shallow water in the, in the ponds. And frogs absolutely love it. So we've got a small garden. It's in a 1970s housing estate. We're sort of in the middle of the estate as well. But we attract, I mean, there were no frogs there, of course, when we started. Uh, started out 18 uh, years ago, but now we can get up to about 80 frogs. And they will come in early in the year, and uh, sometimes the pond's just absolutely full of frogs. You can hear the croaking from inside the house, you know, so it's a massive frog. And there's so much spawn, I have to sort of empty it out because there's not enough room for any more frogs to go into the pond. So I, I, every year I, I like to spend a week or so just drawing and painting the frogs out in our garden. So one of the real highlights of the year. And it's really the first natural history event of the year, so I always look forward to the frogs coming into sport early in the year. Now, newts will often turn up as well in, in ponds like this, but they don't like our ponds. I like, I, I try to attract frogs, because I'm really keen on frogs. Um, if you want to attract newts, you really need a bigger, deeper pond. Uh, newts and frogs don't really get on. Frogs like, they really like our ponds because of that shallow water along the top. In that, and, and they really like to breed often in puddles. And you may see frog spawn in, in puddles up on the moor and wonder why they decide to lay their eggs in a puddle. But the reason for this is newts will eat all the tadpoles of the frogs. So they actually follow frogs around. And if frogs colonise a pond that the newts can live in, then the newts will move in and they'll eat all the tadpoles in the frogs. However many, how much spawn they lay, no, no, no froglets will emerge from that pond. 
So I try and, well, well you, I get the occasional new, but the palms just aren't big enough for them to live in. Uh, and the same with toads. Toads like deep water, and uh, so they, they don't ever come into our little ponds. But we do get a toad, which is one toad in particular, which has been coming back for years. It lives in our garage. It's a huge red thing. A big female toad. Uh, <laughs> she uh, just uh, sits under the door and uh, sits in there and, uh, and comes out. She only appears in the summer. I don't know where she is now. She's gone off to hibernate. And toads can move quite a distance to their breeding pond. So they'll move away from their breeding pond where they spawn in March. <coughs> and they can move a kilometre or so away and then live there during the summer. And this one obviously has found our garden and likes our garden because of all the bugs and things that can eat in there. And then so it stays there for the summer, lives in our garage, and then goes off somewhere uh, in the springtime to breed. Now, if you're lucky, now, when, you've got a, when you're making a wildlife garden like this, you've got to think about what sort of things you'd like to attract to your garden. And obviously, it depends on the size of your garden um, and uh, what sort of wildlife is around. Some things, of course, are never going to come to your garden because they just don't exist in the local area. Other things may do. So if you're lucky to live, I know some people here have, uh, have got grass snakes in their garden, and if you live along the edge, so some friends who live along the edge of our estates get grass snakes in their garden because it's uh, the snakes won't come in, won't cross the road to get to our garden, but they will if you live adjacent to some more wild habitat, particularly streams and rivers. Uh, grass snakes will come in, and if you've got a pond, they will come in because they do like to eat frogs and, uh, and fish and newts and tadpoles and things like that. So uh, you. It is thinking about uh, where you are and what sort of wildlife you might be able to attract by looking at the sort of wider area that you live in. Um, this is the pond that she's some friends, uh, Mark and Dale, who live at the top end of our road. And they've got a bigger pond, and this is deeper than ours, and, and they had lots of frogs in the past, but now the newts have moved in, and uh, the newts have eaten all their tadpoles, so they don't really get many frogs uh, successfully breeding there now. But they do get grass snakes, which come in. I uh, presume the grass snakes will eat the newts as well. So it, is, you get, it depends what you want, really, as to sort of what sort of pond you want to build and uh, what sort of wildlife you want to attract. Uh, in a bigger <coughs> pond like this, you will also get things like dragonflies moving in, and uh, their larvae are a voracious predators, so they will eat all, all the tadpoles as well. Um, but if you, if you like dragonflies, then yeah, if you've got the space, build a, a bigger pond, and then you will attract lots of dragonflies in. Um, I mean, you could, if you, if you really want to, if you're really keen on water, you could just make your whole pond, a whole garden, a bowl full of pond, <laughs> pond a watery habitat, make a little sort of uh, walkway across it, and then have a little place you can sit out in the middle of the water, you know, like being out in the swamp or something. <laughs> uh, so this is one of the common dragonflies which will get attracted to small ponds. This is a southern hawker, and these are great big dragonflies, but they do like to breed in quite small ponds. Our compost bin. Now, decay, anything that's decaying is sort of breaking down, so there's a lot of nutrients coming out of that. So there's lots of, lots of uh, food for different things to feed on. Lots of little bugs are in there, so this will attract other creatures into feed. So if you've got a, a, an area in your garden where you can have a compost heap, compost bin, some, which, some things which are decaying, uh, that's a good thing to have, because it will provide food. This provides food for our frogs and other creatures as well. So, uh, and it provides some compost, which I take and put down on our allotment, too. And you get some strange creatures as well, and you may well have these in your garden, but you may well have never heard of them. And this is a, a shelled slug. Now, uh, you can see here, it's uh, got a little shell on the end. It's never going to go into that shell, of course. Slugs have evolved from snails, and a few of them still retain their shells. But this one has an unusual habitat, habits. Um, it's not going to eat your vegetables because it's actually a subterranean stuff which eats worms. It sucks up worms like spaghetti. And it's not really a danger to worms. It doesn't eat that many. But it uh, has this rather gross uh, feeding habits. So that's the worm eating shell stuff. And I'll get these in our garden. In fact, I'll get two species. There's a bigger grey one as well, which sometimes turns up. Um, but you don't often see them because they're buried down in the ground. Um, and they tend to come up more during the winter months when the worms are nearer the surface. Now, if you want to attract some worm into slugs, I'm sure some of you will, and this is the way to do it. I found this out by accident on our allotment. A sand pit that some children had on the allotment once, and they used to put a carpet over it during the winter months, and I kept looking under this for beetles and things. 
And I found this was a perfect place for worm-eating slugs. They like the sandy soil. So now I create these sort of areas on my allotment. I just get a bit of sand, put a, put a bit of carpet over it, and then if the worm-eating slugs are around, they'll move in and they'll live under there. So it's a good place to climb here, if you want to. Um, now, I always get complaints if I don't put pictures of uh, mating slugs in my films. So here's some mating slugs. Now, slugs aren't particularly popular. And some people think they're a bit dull. But there are some interesting slugs around. And if you've got trees in your garden, you may well attract this slug, which is the leopard slug. And this has some of the most, one of the most bizarre mating habits of any creature on the planet. The, um, I'm not going to go into depth tonight. It comes to one of my other talks. I'm going to talk about this in depth. But these slugs hang by a, a slime rope about a foot or so from a tree branch, and they mate in midair. Uh, slugs are hermaphrodites, so they're male and female at the same time. But they do need to find another slug to mate with. Um, and so these bizarre leopard slugs, which are quite common, uh, mate in this bizarre fashion. Of course, there's a lot of, uh, lot of uh, slug killing uh, agents around. You, know, there's, uh, you can't go into the gardening shops really without seeing slug killer, you know, kill all the slugs, kill everything. I never use this in the garden. I wouldn't recommend using any of these chemicals in your garden. Um, and human beings really are ingenious creatures Surely we can outwit a slug without poisoning it. <laughs> this is what I've made a bit of a mission of doing over the last 20 years or so as a garden. And uh, slugs are important food for creatures like hedgehogs. And we do get hedgehogs in our garden occasionally. I haven't seen them for a while. And they do get killed by slug because they eat slugs which have eaten slug pellets. And so they will eat, eat, you know, ingest these and then they, they can die. So I'm sure that hedgehogs have declined enormously over the last 50 years or so. They used to be very common uh, when I was young. You, you see them squashed on the road all over the place, but now it's very rare that you see, see dead hedgehogs because there just aren't so many about. Because of the cars. <laughs> and, um, and song crushes as well will eat um, snails and slugs. So these are you know, important predators to them. Well, I've got a few tricks which I use, and these work pretty well for keeping slugs off my vegetables. So this is some rocket which I grow in the garden in a pot. And what I do is just put some nylon netting around the rim of it. And the slugs aren't keen on crossing that. They don't like the plastic netting. Um, so this will dissuade them quite well, actually, from crawling up. They, they don't want to cross it, go across that. So it's a very simple way uh, of uh, keeping slugs off. When it's very wet, they seem to just get across anything. And, you put, and then the other trick I do is just popping out just about an hour after dark and just with a torch and just catch all the slugs and uh, throw them away. Well, put them in someone else's garden. <laughs> <laughs> or as my mother-in-law does, she, uh, she chops them in half with a pair of scissors. Uh, oh. Pretty gruesome. But, so that's what she does. And she counts them all as well. <laughs> now, on my allotment, I've got... Um, a neat little system because I, I used to get totally annihilated by slugs. You know, you put out some squashes in the spring and then they just get completely nailed by slugs, and particularly in wet summers. And so, it, you know, you put in another lot and then they get eaten, and it's a bit despairing, really. But I'm not going to use any slug pellets. So, what I came up with a few years ago is I made these slug trenches. So, what they are, I just got some wood from Tragos and some planks, and I made a. a, a made a, a, a trench, quite simple, just made a trench, a square around an area of soil, put in some gravel, and then I've got a bag of road salt, which I can also get from a quarry, or you can buy a, buy a bag of road salt from Tragos. And then when I put the plants in, in the spring, because it's in June, I put the squashes in, I've, I've grown, I just sprinkled some road salt over the top of the gravel, and that's a, a barrier to slugs. Slugs will dissolve in salt and snails as well. So they won't cross that, or if they do, they'll just dissolve before they get the other, to the other side. So now, I, all I have to do is put the plants out, sprinkle a little bit of salt on once, and leave it, and just go and pick the squashes in September. So uh, an effective way of outwitting slugs without using slug pellets. This is our garden shed, uh, which is our old garden shed. It's getting a bit dilapidated. And we never used to get any breeding birds in our garden. It's quite a small garden. It's obviously quite disturbed with people walking by. Uh, but a couple of years ago, we had three species of bird breeding in our garden. It's the first time. Um, first one was a robin, 
and this is the net, so it's just in this box on, it's the, on the shelf. There's the robin. <laughs> and you see, going this year, there's a robin sitting on, on a rent. And you successfully reared the young, the five young, and fledged out of the nest. You could go and have a look at them, just pick it off the shelf when she wasn't there, and have a look at the young, and just check how they were doing. Um, I didn't have to let them go because they had a bit of trouble getting out of the shed, so I left the door open when they, they fledged successfully. Um, and so they hopped on. And there's some other breeding birds I'll, I'll show you later on. Uh, but we had that shed removed, so now we've got a new shed. Last year. Um, you do need the windows open so the robins can go in. Uh, I've covered it in bee hotels, as you see, and I'll talk a little bit about bee hotels now. So these again, some, some of you here may well have bee hotels in your garden. Um, if you do, the, key, the one key thing to do with bee hotels is put them on the warmest wall you can find. Uh, when I first got one, I, I was Joyce bought me one, and I thought, oh, that's a nice little thing. I'll put it in a nice shady spot in the garden. No bees ever came to it. And I was like, oh, this is rubbish. But then I found out that what you actually have to do is put it on a very warm wall. And as soon as I did that, then the bees were straight in. Um, but you don't have to buy an expensive bee hotel. All you need to get is some bamboo, um, chop it up into length. Make sure the hole's about 9 or 10 mil across or smaller. Uh, and uh, just, I just tie them in into bunch, bundles and stick them up on the wall or just stick them on here just in a breeze block uh, on our south facing wall. And I also make some other bee hotels just out of wooden boxes, bits of chopped up wood, uh, anything with a crevice in that the bees can get into. And again, place these in a warm, on a warm south facing wall or the warmest wall that you have. And so this is an example of my bamboo hole uh, canes here. And this is a, another thing I've done, which is a, a glass bee house. So this is use, uses test tubes to get about 9 or 10 mil across. And I've just embed, embedded them into the box with the, the lid on the front. And then from that, you can actually watch the bees. They'll go in and nest in these, and you can watch the bees at work. Because once they're nesting in there, you can just open the door, and they will uh, form their little nest here. So these are solitary bees. Uh, so these ones, just the fe one female will make just uh, her nest on her own. So it's not like a honeybee which has a big hive, they all work together. These are solitary bees. There's about 270 species of bee in, in Britain. Uh, we've recorded about 28 in our garden. Um, and most of them are solitary bees like this. So the female will build this nest and she'll build lots of little um, partitions. This one uses leaf mastic. So she'll collect some pollen, lay an egg on it, and then do another one and another one. And then at the end of the day, a hard day's work, the bee looking down, the bees are lying on the back of it, <laughs> snoring away after a hard day being busy as a bee. That's another little nest box, which my son made me. This is a swift nest box. Uh, we have lots of swifts in Buckersley, and, and in Ashburn as well, it's a good spot for swifts. And so these are, you can get the details of making these online. I'm sure someone somewhere sells swift boxes as well. Um, and uh, we haven't had swifts, but we have had some house sparrows moving, which are nice. So this is our second green bird uh, we've had, which we've had in the garden. And so they've nested successfully in the swift box a couple of times now. Now, I've also made some cob brick bee hotels, and there's some sheets at the front here uh, if you'd like to collect some information on making bee hotels at the end of the tour. And these cob bricks were inspired by this wall in Exeter. This is at Alfington Church, and uh, this is a beautiful old south-facing cob wall. It's hundreds of years old, and it's full of holes, and it's full of bees, particularly in the spring. So I copied that idea, and actually made my own cob bricks, and made my own mini cob wall in our front garden. So I've actually attracted these bees to nest in our front garden. And here we are. And I, what I've done is I've planted some, uh, put some pulmonaria uh, lungwort uh, flowers near the bee hotel in the, in the springtime, which attracts this particular species of bee. These are quite easy to make and quite fun to make as well. I've um, been making at, the wild, making at the Wildlife Trust on a few events for children during the summer. And uh, you, what you need is a high clay content soil, a bit of sand and a bit of straw uh, to make some cob. And then I put them, it usually just put it, you can mould it into a brick, uh, add some water, mould it into a brick, or as, as in this case, put it into a, a wooden box, and then just leave it to dry. Make some holes in it while it's still wet with a bit of bamboo, 
and then just leave it to dry. And uh, what we found is the best stuff to use is stuff called Cricut Pitch Loam, which is ideal for making Cricut pitches, which are obviously got to be hard. And so this is a ready-made mixture which you can buy. Just add a little bit of straw to it, and then just add a bit of water, and you can make a cold brick like this uh, within a few minutes. <coughs> And this is an example that I was up at the Bug Farm up in uh, Pembrokeshire a few weeks ago, uh, helping the staff there, and here they are making a cob brick. So it was uh, pretty easy and good fun as well. It's right, nice, really nice and messy work uh, to have you go, getting your hands stuck in and making these cob bricks. So this is pulmonaria, uh, lung works, and this flowers very early in the year. So when you want, if you want to attract bees like we do, um, we want to have a, a whole range of nectar sources right through the year. And obviously during the summer there's lots of flowers out. And what you've got to have is open flowers, not these sort of double variety flowers which bees can't get at. Uh, just simple open flowers which the bees can access the nectar and the pollen. And uh, so during the summer there's lots of flowers. But early in the spring and in the autumn there's fewer. So it's, uh, it's a good idea to select certain species which to, to plant at those times of the year. We want to as well produce a list of, of flowers which you can pick up at the end of the tour. And here's an example, that's one of the sheets you can pick up. And uh, so we'd be, our garden's a bit of a film set sometimes, so this is uh, filming for Spring Watch uh, this year. We made a film about a hairy-footed flower bee which nests in these top brick walls. And this is it, it's a lovely bee in it. It lives in, uh, lives in gardens, and I've seen it in our garden many times but if I hadn't seen it nesting, I'd seen it nest in abundance in the cob water at, at Exeter, so I made the cob bricks, and uh, the, the hairy-footed bees are now nesting in our garden. They're all hairy-footed bees because the males have these very long hairs on their legs, and they use these when they're mating with the females. So the male, they, they're the size of a smallish bumblebee, but they hover around as well, so they're quite distinctive. Uh, bumblebees don't hover, these do. Um, and uh, this is the, the male is buff coloured as you saw, and this is the female, it's black with gingery uh, orange legs. And they love the pulmonaria, so they will go around the long work flowers feeding on this, and the males will buzz around, they will, the males emerge first, and they will patrol the flowers waiting for the females to come in, and they will try and pounce on them and mate with them. Male bees and wasps are not very subtle in their courtship. Um, they just basically buzz around, they see a female, they jump on her as soon as they can and try and mate with her. And so the, this particular one is a little bit more subtle, it hovers a bit behind the female for a while. The female there, not, not suspecting anything's going to happen, then suddenly the male jumps on her and then he uses his hairy legs like this and he's, no one knows exactly sure what he's doing, but he's probably sort of uh, passing some sort of pheromone scent, some sort of perfume. Uh, sort of aftershave type stuff, onto the female, <laughs> that's an eye, and this uh, entices her to mate. <coughs> that's the hairy footed flower bee. And then after mating, the females will whiz around the garden, uh, collecting nectar from the pulmonaria, is another great hyacinth, there's another good spring flower to have for these bees. Um, and then they will nest in the cob bricks. And then when they finish their nest in the holes, they will seal them up. And so this is some sketches I made of the, uh, the female, so she'll actually wet the mud and then mould it with her body and seal up the nest. And there it is, a freshly made seal. So it's a concave seal and she actually uses her body, it does little somersaults yeah, inside the entrance of the, uh, of the uh, nest just to seal it up. And uh, I've got some videos of this and if you have a look at my website, I'll give you the details at the end. Uh, I've got a YouTube channel with all sorts of videos on and one of these is of the female sealing up her nest and the male is jumping onto the female. <laughs> Other bees you may attract to your bee hotels are uh, things like uh, leaf cutter bees. This is a male leaf cutter bee. And uh, this is uh, another one. Now you can see with these bees, again, like the Osmia bee, they collect the uh, pollen on the underside of their body. Um, they have their pollen head, pollen collecting hairs on the underside of the abdomen rather on the legs, which honeybees and bumblebees have. And uh, you also get, this is another uh, bee which nests in our garden, a grey mining bee, a beautiful bee. Uh, this one will burrow into the ground, as its name suggests, so the females can go maybe up to a metre down into the soil. They'll dig out the soil. And sometimes you may have seen these little, like, little volcanoes appearing on your lawn in the springtime. And these are the mining bees. So they'll burrow down into the soil. And then each, again, the solitary bees, 
So each one will lay during her lifetime about 25 eggs uh, into the soil, and then these will develop over the summer, and then the bees will new bees will hatch the following year. Because a lot of these bees, the solitary bees, just fly for a short period of the time each year, unlike honeybees and bumblebees, which are flying throughout the warmer parts of the year. Uh, the grey mining bee just flies for a few weeks in the springtime, as does the hairy footed bee as well. And this is another little bee. This is attractive, <coughs> another a leaf cutter bee, female. She's attracted to some flea bane. And uh, flea bane is one of the later flowering plants. So it's a wild plant, maybe a weed you might call it, but I, I really like flea bane. It's a beautiful flower, it's a lovely yellow flower, good display, really, really good. Being a native plant, really good plant for insects. So I've got a little patch of flea bane by our front door and I uh, spend a lot of time drawing and painting the bees that come onto it. These are some little furrow bees, uh, tiny little bees. Uh, our bees in Britain range from the big bumblebees, you know, you see the big bucktail bumblebees you see in the spring, to tiny, tiny little bees, which are, are just a few millimetres long. And uh, they will nest in reed stems, so if you, as well as cutting bits of bamboo, if you cut up some dead reed stems, and string them up as well. You'll get these tiny bees and tiny wasps as well nesting in those. So these are the male uh, furrow bees on the flea bane. And these, these males, they don't have a nest to go to, so they actually will roost together. Uh, these roosts are quite hard to find, but we always, for the last 10 years, we've always had a roost of bees in late summer, uh, always right by our front door, somewhere around the seed head, or a bit of vegetation by our front door. I'd have a look out, and they'll always come back to the same spot each evening. Uh, so we have up to 30 of these male bees all roosting together. And they'll all fly into the late afternoon and collect up on whatever seed head they're using that year. Now ivy is another good plant. It's often chopped down, but it's actually a really, really important source of nectar for a lot of insects, particularly at this time of year where there's not much ne other nectar around. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, for instance, a lot of red admiral butterflies at the, at the moment around. And these will be feeding on the ivy. If you go to a nice patch of flowering ivy, you will see uh, butterflies like this. And a lot of other insects, flies and bees as well, feeding on the ivy. And there's one particular bee called the ivy bee, which only collects its pollen from ivy. So this one is, a, is only been in Britain for about 17 years now. Uh, it's uh, colonised the south coast, and then it's moved across Britain, so it's colonising very well. Um, this is a colony in Buckley's Lee. They colonised this area last year, and now the colony is building up, and you can have huge colonies, like thousands of individuals sometimes. They're lovely little bees, and they're easy to identify because if you go to a patch of ivy, this is something here that's flowering, and see a little bee like this with waspy like stripes, but they're buff stripes along the body, uh, it can only be an ivy bee. So it's uh, a nice one to be able to identify. And it's a lovely little bee, too. Now these looking out of its burrow, so these are again they burrow into the either into the ground or sometimes into cliff faces, and the females will again lay about 25 eggs during their lifetime of two or three months. Now this bee is doing so well in Britain because it's uh, it's come across the Channel, and uh, a lot of bees have a lot of pre uh, predators, little parasites, which feed all the work. And then there's a lot of criminal insects which come along and think, right, well that's some of that pollen and we'll eat it all. Or we'll eat their bee grubs, because they've done lots of work. And there's lots of these around, there's bee flies and oil beetles and things like this, which will go into bees' nests. But the ivy bee has been very successful because it's flown all the way across the channel and left its parasites in France. So these are some of them, they haven't got over here, yet. they're desperate to get over here because there's so many ivy bees here that they have a great time. One of them is a little oil beetle called Stenoria, and this is, has a very interesting life history. The, um, the uh, larvae of these oil beetles climb up onto a, onto a fence or whatever, and they clump together and they produce a pheromone scent which smells like a female bee. Then the male bee will come along and try and mate with this lump of, uh, of larvae. They will all climb onto the male, and then when the male does go onto a female ivy bee, that all these larvae will jump off and go onto the female bee. And then they'll get taken back to the nest and then they'll feed on the pollen that that ivy bee has collected for her own young. They're quite a complex life history, these things have. Kind of. And another one is another sort of bee, it's a, a thing called Epiolus. And this is a little solitary bee, quite a beautiful bee. And this is how it sleeps. 
It just sort of claps off in its jaws. It doesn't look very comfortable, but that's what some of these bees do. They don't, they're cuckoo bees, these, so they don't have a nest. And so they, when they go to sleep at night, they just clamp off in their jaws. But again, this one's still stuck over in France, and it hasn't got over here yet. Dandelions are another good flower, often sort of rooted out in gardens, but uh, I really like dandelions, and they're very important for bees during the springtime. A lot of mining bees particularly uh, emerge in the spring, and they love dandelions. And other insects do as well. This is a bee fly, which again is another one of these parasites of, bee, of solitary bees. Uh, you may see these buzzing around in your garden. They're like tiny little bees with a long tongue sticking out the front. Uh, they look a bit sort of uh, ferocious, but they, um, they, they're completely harmless to us. Um, but to a bee, uh, they're, big, they're not, not good news. They will lay their eggs around where bees nest, and again, their larvae will eat the bee larva in its nest and turn into a bee fly rather than a bee. Now, the orange tip butterfly, which uh, flies in the spring, uh, that will often be, have beautiful camouflage markings and they will often sit on their seed heads of dandelions, actually in the evening, and other white flowers. Uh, these butterflies fly in April and May. Beautiful butterflies, and you see these around the lanes. And this is something I'd seen around up the sleeve, so it was, it was something that occurred in the lanes around us. Uh, it, they, and the caterpillars feed on garlic mustard and cooking flour. And, and so it was something I wanted to attract to my garden. I knew they were around, but I'd never seen them in the garden. So I planted some garlic mustard, and uh, a few years later, uh, some orange chips came in and they started to breed in the garden. So it's about looking and looking wider than your garden, looking at the widest countryside, seeing what sort of creatures live there, and then seeing, finding out a bit about them, what they feed on, maybe certain plants that you can grow. Grow those, and if, you, if, you, if they're around in the local habitat, they'll come in, they'll find the habitat in your garden. And it's great to have these things uh, living in your garden. So this is uh, some garlic mustard. Uh, this is a biennial plant, so uh, it will grow one year and then flower the next year. So if you want to introduce it into your garden, collect the seeds over two years, and then you'll have a constant supply of it after that. And there's the caterpillar of the orange chip butterfly, and it feeds on the seed pods of the plant. So very, very camouflaged and quite easy to buy. And then it spends most of the year as a chrysalis. So now all the orange tip butterflies you see in the spring are all chrysalis and somewhere out in the vegetation. Um, and they're either green or they're brown and they just look like a thorn. So they're very, very difficult to find. I've only ever found two during the winter in all the years I've looked for them. Apples as well. It's good. Um, Good idea to put out uh, uh, some rotting apples, particularly <coughs> late in the year, in, uh, in September and October time. And this will attract insects to come into the fermenting fruit, uh, especially things like red apple butterflies. If you've got a hornet nest nearby, uh, you'll get hornets coming in to feed, not only on the fruit, but also on the other insects which come around the, uh, the fruit as well. And other butterflies, uh, as uh, recorded, uh, 20 odd species of butterfly in my garden. Uh, some of them breed in the garden, most are just visitors coming in for nectar, um, and some like this live in the woods around us, the beautiful silver wash artillery. Uh, they feed the cattle to feed on violets in the Henry Woods and places like that around us. Um, so they won't breed in our garden, but they will occasionally come in to visit if you have a good supply of nectar. Stinging nettles as well. Uh, they're good for butterflies, particularly some of the species which do like to come into gardens, like small tortoise shells and red apples. Uh, they, their caterpillars feed on stinging nettles. Um, but if you grow stinging nettles, it's a good idea. It's, um, you need to have them in a nice warm um, It's no good having them in a little shady spot in the corner somewhere. Because the caterpillars of these butterflies do like to be in a nice warm spot. So if you want to attract butterflies to breed in your garden, like these, uh, these um, nettle feeding ones, uh, plant some nettles, which will encourage the nettles to grow, but make sure they're in a nice warm spot in the garden, out in the full sun. And these are the caterpillars of the peacock butterfly, uh, which will be on the nettle. And thistles as well, uh, they, they're good. I mean, again, they can be a bit of a weed, but if you've got a, some space for some thistles somewhere, you can manage them to a certain degree. But they're good for, particularly for the painted lady butterfly, which is a migrant butterfly which breeds, which, uh, breeds in North Africa in, very early in the year and then works its way up through Europe. 
usually gets to us in about June time. We'll breed here in the summer, and then the adult butterflies will fly back down into Morocco to spend the winter. So this time of year, they've all gone from Britain, but they're all down in that way down in Africa now, and they'll start that whole cycle again. So you can keep some of the populations of these butterflies going by having a few thistles in the garden. And other butterflies as well. So again, it's looking at things in the wider landscape. This is some birds for prep oil, which grows along the road verges near me. And if you grow this in your garden, you can well attract the common blue. Uh, it's called the common blue, and it used to be abundantly common. Right? It's an old <coughs> that have spoken to me many times about how when they were children, they used to be clown, literally clouds of these butterflies in the meadows around where they lived. But now it's quite a rare butterfly, really. It's, uh, it's, it's, still, it's called the common blue, but I, I don't really see that many. And it, and it could be a lot commoner if there was more of its food plants around. So if you've got some space with some clovers, uh, birds with trap oil, various vetches, things which it feeds on, uh, plant them out in your garden, you may well be lucky to have this butterfly come in and breed. Same with ragworms as well. Now ragworm, of course, is, is not good for uh, in hay fields where uh, if uh, livestock and hay is uh, grown for livestock because it is poisonous to livestock in that situation. Um, but livestock won't actually eat it. Um, and, but it and it's a very good um, food plant for caterpillars such as the cinnabarmot, uh, which feeds on the ragwort. Um, and also a number of bees and wasps uh, feed on the nectar as well from the flowers. So it's, it's quite... It, if you've got a space where you can grow it, and I grow ragwort in our garden, it's not near any livestock. It's actually a really good thing to have for a lot of insects, and it flowers over quite a long period, could have been in the late summer too. And growing it in our garden, I've attracted insects which I've, I've never really seen anywhere else. It's a little tiny little mining bee, and I've only seen this once in Plymouth, and then I didn't even realise it lived in Buckersley, but I grew some ragwort, and then this little Andrina bee turned up in our garden. And uh, I've never seen it anywhere else around town, but it obviously exists somewhere around and growing the right sort of plants for it attracts it in. Elephant hawk moth caterpillars. Now, if you grow um, fuchsias, you may well get these enormous caterpillars. They look a bit like a snake, uh, quite ferocious looking things, but they're totally harmless. And uh, they will be on, uh, naturally be on um, things like uh, beds of willow herbs, and, uh, but they'll also be on garden fuchsias as well. And they turn into these beautiful pink moths which aren't so often seen because they fly at night in June uh, and so you rarely see these unless you run a moth trap. Uh, this is some Malay plants. Now, I've grown some of these in the garden to attract a certain, another species of moth, the Malay moth. And these are the beautiful caterpillars of this moth. And if you grow this plant, you'll almost certainly get these moths coming in. You probably won't see the moth, but you will see the caterpillars feeding on the plant. On the plant. That's the moth, that's why you won't see it. It just looks like a bit of wood chicken. So it will be sat around on a tree somewhere in your garden on a bit of bark and almost impossible to see. It's a caterpillar of a Jersey tiger moth. Now this one feeds on dandelions. It's quite, it's not an easy one to see. It tends to skulk away in the undergrowth. Um, and you tend to see, more often see, the adult uh, moths, the Jersey tiger moths, which fly during August. And they look a bit like a butterfly, very uh, brightly coloured day flying moth. And uh, quite, a, quite a common species, particularly in towns and villages around South Devon. Another one you might, another day flying moth you might see is the hummingbird hawk moth. Um, particularly likes things like red valerian and buddleia uh, flowers. And this is a very fast moving moth. Um, and it looks a bit like a hummingbird, often mistaken for a hummingbird. Um, and it whizzes around. And this again is a migrant moth. So it actually flies up from the Mediterranean in varying numbers each year and reaches us and then it will breed in this country and then uh, the resulting adults will often fly back south to spend the winter further south towards the Mediterranean. Now if you want to attract these to breed in your garden, uh, the caterpillars feed on bed straws. So what I've done is I plant, and they particularly like bed straws I found which were growing on walls. So they're in a nice warm situation again. So I've uh, planted some bed straws over our, some of our tyres and a bit of a breeze block there as well. So they're hanging over on the south facing spot. And uh, just having that, and lots of flowers around the garden, so the hummingbird hawk moths are coming in, and they will lay eggs on there. So I frequently find the caterpillars of the hummingbird hawk moth. They're quite hard to see. You see it sat in there, they sit upside down, 
very, very camouflaged. They're quite big caterpillars, but superbly camouflaged. And that's one I've taken out. It has a little blue horn on the end with a yellow tip. So if you find a caterpillar with a horn on the end like that, it's a, some kind of hawk moth uh, caterpillar. And this is a hummingbird hawk moth. Now, if you want to attract moths and see which species of moth you've got around in the garden, a good way is to run a moth trap. Uh, this is a special moth trap or a Robinson trap that has a mercury vapor light, uh, which is, produces a lot of ultraviolet light, and this is particularly attractive to night flying insects, especially moths. You catch hundreds of moths which you never believe lived in your garden because uh, they're night flying and uh, they, uh, they're just, as you saw from the, uh, the Malay moth, they're incredibly camouflaged during the day and very difficult to see. So running a moth trap is a good way to attract some wildlife into your garden. This is something you might not want, but it's something I'm interested in. This is a, a rock bottle, and this, is, this mimics a, a rotting hole in a tree. Uh, they often get rock holes in trees which collect water. And this is a super habitat for certain species of insects, particularly flies and bugs and things like that. So I, I, plant some, I put some of these out of the garden, and I've attracted this amazing tiger crane fly into the garden, beautiful coloured crane fly. And I've never seen this any, I've never seen it before, I've never seen it since. Uh, but I put one of these uh, bottles up in the tree of the garden with some wood chippings in, and these, these came in and colonised that bottle. Um, so uh, you can catch some amazing things which you've never even heard of before, just by making these little micro habitats. Uh, one thing I'm working on at the moment is a, a rat tail maggot. And this is a, again, you might not want to attract them into your garden, but they, they, they again, they, they will feed, they feed in these rotting holes, but they actually feed on the bacteria which, which are decomposing uh, the um, wood and often dung as well. You often get these in drains in farmyards, which is what I'm, I'm mimicking by putting a bit of manure in, into the uh, water as well to attract these rat tail maggots. And they grow into uh, drone flies. So this is a, a bee mimicking fly, which you often see this time of year, these hibernate as adults. And so this is a, a drone fly. And these like some of the late flowering plants, like the uh, ivy, uh, the Michaelmas daisy, that's a good late flowering uh, plant, so that's good for some of the late species of butterflies and insects. Uh, cat mint, uh, cat nip, this is which uh, will also flower late, well, flowers right through the season. So that's a good flower to have as well. This is a local speciality which uh, grows around up the sleeve uh, and Ashburton as well. They're called the Deptford Pink. It used to be reasonably common in southern England, but now the biggest population in Britain is in Buckersley on the road verges there. And uh, so, uh, some of the seeds from these uh, plants have ended up in our garden on our drive and around the flower beds. And so I know a number of people, other people here have got this rare plant growing in their garden. Uh, things like poppies uh, came up through the first year. So if you want to have things like poppies in your garden, you've got to disturb the soil each year because they only grow in disturbed ground. So they're very good, nice open flowers and very good for bumblebees. A big bumblebee coming into feed. Another bee which I've attracted into the garden is by uh, a thing called a wool carver bee. And this one loves these lambs here. Uh, Stachys lamata it's called a type of wound work with very hairy leaves. <coughs> There's the wool card of bee now. And uh, these, uh, what happens with this bee is that the male bees will protect an area of flowers um, and they will chase off any other insects which try and come and uh, get the nectar from the flowers. Um, they'll chase off even tiny bees and big bumblebees and things. And they'll protect that food source just for the female wool card of bees. Um, so here he is chasing off various honeybees and things. But when the wool card bee female comes in, she's allowed to feed and then she goes in and mates with the female. Now these are interesting bees because they, you've heard of leaf cutter bees which collect leaves to make their nests. This one actually makes little woolly sleeping bags for the, for the young uh, out of the hairs from um, plants such as this. And here's the female, she digs away, uh, chews away on the, the hairs and makes a ball of cotton wool like this and then she'll fly up to her nest and uh, make a nest, which is often in a crevice. I've never actually found the nest myself, but it'll be in a crevice in a wall. Arms are flying across the road somewhere into the neighbour's house, so I haven't tracked them down. 
lots of other insects in the garden, lots of ground beetles and things which uh, when you provide a lot of habitat, so like the, uh, the, uh, the ponds and the uh, rotting vegetation, this attracts lots of smaller insects which attracts predatory insects such as these, which are good for you know, keeping down pests in the garden or on my allotment as well. And uh, small spiders, this is a little jumping spider which we get on the around the bee hotel, actually on the wall, the south facing wall. And other spiders, such as crab spiders, which live on the flowers. These particularly specialise, this particular species lives on flowers and it ambushes insects which come in to feed on the flowers. And I found a little UV torch, actually, mainly for looking for scorpions, because you do get a few scorpions in Devon, but I've never managed to find one. Um, but I had a go with the garden, actually, out in the garden, and found that um, it's very effective for finding these spiders. I uh, shine a UV torch, and these spiders suddenly glow in the darkness. And also for these caterpillars as well, the pale tussock moth caterpillar, or hot dog caterpillar. I found that glows like a beacon as well when you use this torch. It's uh, a good fun way to explore the garden at night. Another big spider, uh, which occasionally lives in our garden, is the wasp spider. As you can see, it's a, resemble, a female resembles a wasp sitting in a web. It's quite a big spider. Now, these spiders um, and a lot of other spiders will leave their, will spin an egg cocoon and leave that over the winter. So, if you if you've got a meadow area, for instance, or a bit of rough ground, and you've got spiders like this living in it, it's best to not cut it all down uh, during the autumn, because otherwise you will destroy the eggs of the uh, of these spiders. So, if you have an area like this, it's always best to just leave a little bit. Or the key thing is to not destroy all of it, because then you will destroy all of the eggs. If you, say, cut half of it, then you're only going to cut, uh, uh, destroy half of them, and the other half will repopulate the whole area the next year. We get some bizarre things that you might never have believed live in Britain, even. And these live in our road, um, and they're uh, New Zealand stick insects. Now, these were imported with uh, ferns and other plants from New Zealand uh, about 150 years ago now. Uh, they ended up in places like Penzance, <coughs> Painted Zoo was one area, and they're huge great things, um, things are animals. And, and these live, particularly they live most frequently in gardens, and they like cypress hedges and Japanese cedars and things like that. And they can hide away during the day, and they're actually nocturnal. So you just go out with a torch at night, and you may be surprised at finding this giant uh, stick insect sitting on the bush. Crickets and grasshoppers, this is a speckled bush cricket, a small cricket, which lives in, often lives in gardens, uh, particularly likes roses. Uh, the oak bush cricket, which uh, doesn't just live on oaks, it will live on any, any shrubs, and that one will can actually fly, so it may well come into your house at night. The field grasshopper, this is the most likely grasshopper to colonise a garden because it can fly quite red, readily. So it will uh, fly in, particularly in hot weather, and colonise uh, small areas of grass. And a tiny little grasshopper type thing called a ground hopper. This is only about a centimetre long, and these live in flower beds on bits of bare ground, and they feed on mosses. And the big monster one we get here is this locust-sized great green bush cricket. You just hear these. They're the only ones. You can hear a cricket when you're driving on the A38 in your car, and you know it's going to be one of these. It's an absolute monster, a great green bush cricket, a huge, great locust-sized thing, um, Britain's biggest cricket, and the loudest as well. But very, very camouflaged, and actually quite difficult to see, because it is, again, it's a nocturnal insect. Bindweed, not popular, um, but uh, it does tend to take over. But I do try and sneak in a little patches of bindweed into the garden, because you get these um, lovely little moth, moths which feed on it, so blue moths. Here's the caterpillars and the chrysalis. And uh, here's a freshly emerged plume moth, a tiny little moth. And they have, as you can see, plumes for their wings, like little feathered wings. And uh, these hibernate as adults, so you'll find them right through the winter. And you can see they rest in this very characteristic way. They roll their wings up and they rest in a T shape. So you'll see these, uh, no doubt. If you have any bindweed in your garden or nearby, you'll see these moths. Very camouflaged again, though, uh, in, in amongst the dead leaves. Another plant I grow each year is nicotiana, or tobacco flower. I collect the seeds up, uh, pop them on, slugs absolutely love these, so you have to protect them uh, at all costs, because they would just annihilate them. I grow them up each year and put them out in the garden, hoping for this uh, good year for a certain species of migratory moth to turn up. And last year was an exceptional year for this, 
and uh, it was a convolvulus hawk moth, a huge great moth, which occasionally comes up in large numbers from the Mediterranean. And uh, they love these flowers, because this moth has a 14 centimeter long tongue. It's a huge moth, you can hear it coming in, sort of whirring in, and it flies at dust. And uh, so I set up all the plants, and the neighbors think I'm nuts anyway. <laughs> I had, had them all set up here, and the moth would come in each evening, and then visit each flower. So you can see this huge great moth coming in, and if you just, and it went to every flower once, it seems to know which flower it's been to. So all you had to do is just stand by one flower, and it would literally come in and fly right by your face. You could feel the wind, the wind off on your face. Real magical thing to see. That's our uh, garden cleared up, not as I say, during the winter months, and uh, <coughs> flowers and things, and uh, the lilac tree there, which is our uh, bird habitat. So in the, in the spring, there's a lot of flowers. And lovely in May, our lilac, because it's, uh, it flowers beautifully, with that sort of floppy white blossom. Uh, but most of the year, it's, um, it's uh, leafless from this time of year, um, but it's our bird feeding station. So, and also nearby we've got some hazel scrub as well which grows up and that's our third breeding bird in the garden which is the blackbird and if you've got a little bit of cover somewhere uh, blackbirds will often try and nest in anywhere they can sneak into a garden they have just enough cover to keep them away from cats and so these nested successfully long-tailed tits one of my favorite birds we've seen from my other talks they do come occasionally come into our garden but they've never nested uh, they come in prospecting um, but they will like climbers, so if you've got some creepers growing up a wall and they're sort of out of, uh, uh, sort of height for you know, cats and things to get to, um, you could well get uh, long-tailed tits coming in and nesting. It would be a fabulous thing to have in the garden, because they're actually quite tame in their nesting. Our log pile, uh, again, is an important habitat for all sorts of creatures. There's some little wood mice that live in there, they pop out and uh, uh, get some of the food which is dropped down from the bird feeders. We get slow worms coming in and uh, breeding in the garden. And the wren loves the wood pile, because the wren, the reason the wren is, has such a small tail and such a little tiny round bird is because it goes into little crevices and holes. So it goes right down into the wood pile looking for spiders, particularly in the winter. Of course, you get all the, the common birds. As soon as you put some food out, you get blue tips and gray tips and gold tips coming in. But we also get some more unusual birds. So this is a meadow pipit, which is you know, usually found up on Dartmoor, but they will occasionally come into gardens. And uh, this is a siskin, another bird which breeds around the moor. So they are about, so uh, if you put out food, you well attract these birds into your garden. And occasionally things like fire crests. Now, there's a lot of fire crests that come in this autumn, as in many, many hundreds of them. So it's worth looking out in your garden for this bird this year, uh, over the winter. Like a, a tiny, tiny bird, our smallest bird, along, along with the gold crest. But this one is immediately distinguished by its very bright white stripe over its eye. So, uh, and it's very quite bright green plumage as well. So look out for fire crests. So <coughs> it's already been one on my allotment, uh, and a few others have been seen in South France, I know, as well. This is uh, a friend of mine photographing another quite scarce bird which came into our garden a few times now over the winter. This is the black red start. Uh, this, these birds actually migrate over from places like Germany and Poland where they spend the summer, but uh, quite a few of them winter over in Britain. And in, in, in Germany, for instance, they, are, they replace robins as a garden bird. So when they come over here, they're quite happy to live in gardens. Our robins don't like them much, they chase them off. But uh, if you haven't got a particularly aggressive robin, uh, then you could well get black red stars coming in. Apples are good things to, uh, to put out as well. I've, I've been out collecting apples over the last week or so. The collect windfall apples uh, either leave some out around or I usually take a few in and uh, dry them off and keep them in the garage. And then if we do get any periods of particularly cold weather, I can put them out for the birds to feed on. And uh, often uh, one of the birds you will attract with apples is, is the black cat. Again, this is quite a common breeding bird in Britain. But the ones that winter here actually come from Eastern uh, Europe. So again, places like Poland and Germany, they, they, the birds that breed there, are quite a few of them migrate over to Britain to spend the winter here. And they love apples. So what I do is just skewer a half apple onto a twig, and then the black caps often come in and feed on those. And you can put it up right outside your window and get beautiful close views like this. And again, if you get some cold weather, if we do get some snow, I've got that supply of apples, so I can put it out. 
And then, especially some of the thrushes, the blackbirds and redwings and field bears are very, very hungry, and they'll come into gardens to feed and get some fabulous views of these usually really shy birds. Cats, I mean, they're not popular in our garden. Um, being, yeah, being keen on wildlife, I'm not keen on cats. I tend to chase them off when they come in, because they are a bit of a problem. They do chase our frogs. They eat the slow worms and things, so I do try and sway cats as much as I can. This is a poor black cat, which was just about to migrate back to Germany, but cats have caught it and uh, torn its tail off, so it's not going to go very well or anything like that. And uh, this is our Cotoniasta. This is a, a Cotoniasta tree, which was planted when the house was built in the 1970s. A massive blossom in July time and attracts this humming with insects. But during the winter, it's red with berries, and, and this attracts birds as well. So a nice berry bush is good to have. And again, things like thrushes, such as red wings, will come in to feed. These are, are migrant birds which come over from Scandinavia. And if you're out at night at the moment, um, and you're out and on still night, just listen for some thin sort of calls overhead. It's a very ca characteristic sound of the night at this time of year. And these are migrating red wings going over. They're coming over from Scandinavia to winter with us here. And uh, our most unusual visitor we've ever had is uh, a ring eater. And this is uh, usually a shy moorland bird. But a couple of years ago now, we had one of these turn up in our garden. It lived in our garden over the winter for about three months. And, you know, this is something I'd spend hours traipsing around on the moor trying to find. And suddenly, you go out to the weedy bin, and there's a ring eater just sat in front of you. And it, but it was quite aggressive. It chased off everything else. It only it wanted all the berries. It could never eat all those berries. It's not a sharing kind of bird. So it's actually protected that food source. And so all the blackbirds were terrified of going in to the bush, even for months after it had gone. Uh, I'm just going to finish off by uh, uh, showing you some, this is some slides from Thomas given me on creating meadows in your garden. And this can be done on any scale. So this is a, a simple idea. It's probably the simplest way of creating a meadow if you have an existing lawn. And that is simply just to leave it to grow. So in this case, um, it's been neatened up a bit by you know, tidying up the edges, maybe uh, mowing a path for it or mowing the edges along. So it looks like it's meant to be there. It's not an overgrown sort of uh, wasteland like our garden used to be. Um, and this, of course, lots of flowers come up in it. You may well have lots of flowers there already. Buttercups, which are good. Uh, any flowers are good for insects. Um, they're certainly better than having a bare lawn. And so I think this one's cut every few weeks. Yeah, so you've got a constant source of, of, uh, of flowers. And of course, these are really important, having areas like this for some of the aerial feeding birds. Things like house martins and swallows, they just feed on aerial feeding insects. So having lots of flowers in your garden will provide lots more food for these birds. And this is a more radical uh, approach to uh, making a meadow in your garden. This is actually stripping off the, uh, the turf and the soil and actually uh, getting it down to the bed soil and then seeding that up. Uh, so this is uh, seeded with a wildflower mix, Donna. And uh, so we have a wildflower mix. But in the first year, there's quite a lot of annual seed. So the, the will come up in the disturbed ground. So they will provide a splash of colour in the first year. It's up poppies and corn marigolds. But uh, if you want to keep those going, then you've got to disturb the ground again each year. Uh, but in this case, this is more of a permanent meadow. So those will just come up in the first year. And then things like the oxide daisies and the um, eyebrights and other flowers like this, hawk bits and things like this, will all come up and establish themselves and make a, a beautiful meadow. This is quite a, quite a large scale, but you can do this on any scale. So it could be you know, just a few square feet. And uh, it would be a, a fabulous thing to have in your garden if you've got space. And again, it will attract lots of insects. So lots of insects will come in there and benefit from that. It's a, a, a more diverse habitat than a, just a flat lawn. There's a lot more structure to it. So lots of insects can live down in the bottom there. Some others will feed on the flowers. So there's a whole load more food suddenly for uh, not just for insects and their predators, but for also things like the birds around the garden. And you can plug plants into that. So once you've got the uh, uh, meadow established, uh, these are some fertilities and are there crocuses there as well? Well, shoot it there. So you could add a splash of colour at various times of the year, particularly early in the year. Is it, is it known back during the late? It's, it's not known from December onwards, 
Right, okay. So it's not in the autumn and then left, and then the bulbs come up first, and then the meadow develops quite quickly during uh, May and June, and then flowers in the summer. And uh, again, plug planting, this is uh, Chantal plant, uh, taking out some plug plants, things like um, oxide daisies and eyebrights and things like this, from an existing meadow. And then, so this is a way as if you've got a, a lawn of some sort which hasn't, not particularly diverse. If you know somebody who's got a meadow, uh, go out in the autumn and actually take, to, take out some of the plants from that meadow and plug plant them into yours. And then you've instantly got a more diverse habitat. And these are little squares which are cut in, again, in a similar uh, lawn. And uh, these are squares of bare ground. And into this is seeded yellow rattle. A uh, yellow rattle is a very uh, useful plant for in meadow creation. Uh, what you don't want in what you want in meadows is lots of flowers and not so many grasses. So the grasses can become very dominant. So yellow rattle is actually a <coughs> parasite of grasses. So it will actually um, feed on feed on the grasses through their roots and actually suppress the growth of the grasses and allow the other flowers to flourish. Uh, again, collecting the seeds is the best way to do this. So that if you know there's somebody who's got some yellow rattle in their meadows already. And the best way is I use my insect sweep net. It's a very good way of just sweeping up all the uh, seeds during uh, July time. And then you let all the grasshoppers things jump on and you're left with the yellow rattle seeds which you can then sow during the autumn. Uh, finally, this is an idea from Nikki Scott. Uh, this is a, uh, a rooftop garden. So if you haven't got any space or maybe you've got a shed, a shed roof garden. So it's a, a simple idea, but very effective, uh, just having a, a shallow area of soil, and again, seeding that up, uh, plug planting it, and you've instantly got a lovely flower-rich habitat for insects uh, to live in, uh, and it's uh, not actually using any space at, at all if you have got a lawn, but you have got some sort of roof space, so an effective way to attract insects into your garden, and a very colourful way of making use of that space as well. Okay, if you'd like any more information on other talks I'm doing, if you'd like to see those slugs made in the have a look on my website, just join me to I am doing a talk at the RSPB uh, at Southern Hay in Exeter on the 14th of November. If you'd like to come along to that, don't need to be a member of the RSPB. Uh, details of that on my website. And uh, thank you very much for listening.